Hello, and welcome to our final production of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution's Community Conversations. It's been an extraordinarily tough year for so many families, and we wanted to end the year on a positive note by bringing you one of Atlanta's greatest traditions, the Nutcracker, brought to you by the Atlanta Ballet. We're bringing you today exclusive behind the scenes access like only the AJC can provide. We hope you'll enjoy this, and we also hope you'll come back to us in 2021 for more of our Atlanta Journal Constitution's Community Conversations, where we're keeping you informed and connected. Now sit back and relax. You will enjoy this, I promise. And also from everyone at the AJC, we want to wish you a safe and happy holiday season and a very happy new year. I'm Bo Emerson with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and I'm here with the dance critic Cynthia Perry and we are at the Atlanta Ballet to talk about ballet in a special edition of one of our community conversations. We are going to focus on the Nutcracker because it's the holiday season and this is when most of you will probably go to the ballet except not this year. It's been a different year for the Atlanta Ballet as it's been for all of us. I don't have my mask on right now because I'm keeping Cynthia six feet away, uh, but she's going to tell us a little bit about what we're going to do today. Thank you, Bo. Thank you for having me. It's a really exciting time, actually, just to see how this dance company has pivoted and adapted and found ways to continue to create art that helps us to celebrate the seasons right now. And we're going to be going behind the scenes here at Atlanta Ballet. Bo is going to visit the costume shop and look at some of the scenery from Atlanta Ballet's Nutcracker production. I'll be speaking with the artistic director, Gennady Nedvigin, as well as two dancers, Sergio Macero Olarte, who dances the role of the Nutcracker Prince, and Emily Carrico, who dances the role of Marie. What we have this year is not a live production, but a virtual production on video, which is available right now streaming online as Nutcracker On Demand. And some of you may have gone to the drive-in Nutcracker uh, at the Cobb Energy Center, which is where they were hoping to put it on this year, but will hopefully happen next year. And also there's going to be little tidbits about the Nutcracker called 30 Days of Nutcracker popping up on social media here and there. That's right. Uh, so today we hope that you all will sit back and relax and enjoy our visit to Atlanta Ballet. We are here at the Atlanta Ballet with some great dancers who are all part of the Nutcracker. We're going to show you how they put this ballet together, but first we're going to start with a little behind the scenes look at the costume shop. We are in the costume shop at, at the Atlanta Ballet, and we are with Colleen McGonigal, who is the costume manager. And how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. So we are surrounded by costumes that you're actually building for a show that y'all are going to put on in the spring, uh, you know, if everything works out right. Yes, uh, most of the costumes that we're currently working on are for uh, Snow White, our children's show uh, choreographed by Bruce Wells. And these folks are actually putting together Snow White's costume as we speak, is that Yes, right? yes, we, we saved the best for last. Uh, we had worked on the Butterfly Corps, um, and some other characters, but now we're working on Snow White herself, so. But this is also where you have put together the 200 costumes that you have for the Nutcracker. Uh, this is part of the place. The Nutcracker actually took about two years of planning and work, um, and it was spread out through shops throughout the world, really. Um, we had makers in the UK, we had makers in Germany, uh, we had people in Seattle working on them. Because it is 200 uh, costume pieces and we're such a small shop, we had to sort of spread the workload. And then they mail them back to you or? Uh... Uh, they would actually travel with them. They would, uh, from the UK, they actually came by boat um, and they put them on, they packed them up and sent them and then they flew over and 
we did fittings together, um, and then they sort of handed things off to us, and then we finished construction. So. And we talked about uh, how the the dancers will sometimes tear something, and uh, in fact, this is a very vigorous uh, uh, activity, and uh, you have to be ready with a needle and thread during performances when something when something gets ripped or comes apart. Yes, uh, it is. As beautiful as all of these costumes look, they put up with so much wear and tear. I mean, the dancers, it's extremely physical, and uh, so they go through a lot. And some of them are harder on costumes than others, I suppose. I mean, yes, but uh, that is true in every field I've worked in, so. And now you have uh, some of the folks uh, who have been part of the Nutcracker modeling some of the costumes right now that you'd like to introduce us to. Yes, um, if I can have our act one, um, our gossip and maid. <laughs> gossip girl and maid. And uh, would you tell a little bit about the, the costumes and how, how they were constructed? Um, so the reason we have these two costumes together, they're both in act one, but they tell very different tales about our characters. Um, as you can see, Caitlin in her gossip is outside with her hat and her coat. Um, and unfortunately never gets invited to the party. They just move on. Uh, whereas Georgie is working inside as a maid and has her apron. Um, both of these dresses are constructed with movement in mind. Uh, Sandra Woodall, the costume designer for the piece, is very conscious about how the dresses move and flow. Um, so in the case of the gossip skirt, um, it's an incredibly lightweight layers of chiffon. Um, so that it catches the air and just moves beautifully on stage. Um, Georgie's is a little bit heavier silk, but she still has her little ruffles at the hem uh, to give her sort of a fluttery movement. And these are both made of silk? Yes, they are all made uh, silk and wool. And you mentioned that uh, some of your costumes are, you keep them for years. Yes. So you, you sew them back together again and get them ready for the next, uh, the next crowd coming through. Yes, uh, these costumes, uh, I think, Caitlin, have you worn yours a couple of years in a row now? Um, and so, yeah, every year, uh, if we can, we try to put the same dancer back in the same costume. Um, but if it's a new person to a new role, then we alter it to fit that new person. And then she takes it home and throws it in the washing machine or? <laughs> no, uh, we don't let things out of the building. No. Um, the same people who uh, are there and taking care of repairs then also take care of the laundry in the evenings. So, and you, thank you so much for coming out. And uh, you have uh, two folks from the la second act of the, of yes. the Nutcracker. Tell, yes. tell us about them. Thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so next up we have our snow costume. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and we're giving Miss Winnie a bit more space. <laughs> And so now, when they build a costume like this, do they have to build it right on you? Um, the initial, we sent measurements, um, and because all of the makers have worked with dancers, they can generally make the pattern without seeing. But this particular costume was made in Germany, and Birgit, uh, who was the maker, flew over and we did fittings. Um, and then she flew back and finished the costumes, and then came back and we did our second round of fittings to make sure that everything was just the way she wanted it. And, uh, uh, and so that was at least two uh, transatlantic flights for that costume. Yes, yeah. And then, then, then somebody came with the costume when it came here. Yes. Well, actually, uh, Birgit had managed to uh, spiral these skirts um, into her luggage and ah. uh, brought them with her, which was an amazing thing to watch them sort of in a magical box kind of way, all of these skirts just kept coming out of this very small piece of luggage. Because so. talk about the, 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 what makes the uh, form uh, remain. You have a, a kind of steel in there that holds that. Uh, this is actually, um, in the skirt itself, is actually a carbon rod that um, ah. we get from kite making suppliers. Pipe making? Kite. Oh, kite making suppliers. Uh, yes, which all right. is a thing that I was unaware of okay. until um, <laughs> I had to source it. Um, but yes, it helps keep the shape of the skirt. Um, Yuri wanted, when they do a spin, for it to flatten out a bit and look a bit more like a snowflake. Uh -huh. um, and so this was the technique that uh, Birgit, the maker, and Sandra, the designer, came up with.
And of um, course, in the old days, they used whalebone, but they don't have as much whalebone now. Yes. Uh, in the mm -hmm. bodice, there's the spiral steel, um, mm -hmm. and the whalebone is what used to be used. Um, but yes, uh, not, not anymore. And you have uh, another, uh, another costume that you would like to show us, is yes. that right? Yes. Our uh, final one for today is our flower. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So this is the flower core in Act Two. So, um, and you have a kind of a woodland theme uh, in your crown and in and in some of the decorations here. Tell about how you make those things. Um, so this costume was actually built by makers in the UK, um, and we actually had someone who specifically made the headpieces and decoration on this. Um, and she actually, each one of those leaves is handmade. Um, and decorated. So it took her days, weeks, um, just to make the decoration for the flower costume. Um, and the other thing that is wonderful about this costume is actually all of the painting on the bodice is hand painted. Um, so you get that lovely modeled effect. Um, the designer's sort of vision for this was um, the bushes you see in winter where there's a light dusting of snow and just a few leaves hanging on, um, but with that kind of hope of spring, so there's just a little bit of blue shot throughout the costume. So this is spiral so steel. This is spiral steel boning, and we use it to help keep the smooth line that you see here. Um, but part of the reason we use it, there's also just steel boning, which is, doesn't have as much flexibility. What we like about this is that it can bend and move with the dancer a little bit more. Um, and so the odds of them getting poked go down substantially when we use it. Uh, if we use the other one, it just doesn't allow them to move the way that they need to move. It's, it's quite an engineering marvel. Yeah, it is um, almost like chain mail in the way that it is yes. sort of individual links stacked together. So. And now you mentioned gemstones uh, uh, in this in this costume here. Uh, well, she has the rhinestones, which is just a little bit of sparkle you see from sure. stage, um, and they are all um, glass, um, which gives you just a little bit more sparkle than um, plastic versions. Right. So. So you can't tumble dry this, it would, um, no. that wouldn't work out. We well. actually, um, before we send these to the cleaners, all of the um, flowers come off, all of the leaves come off, and we set them to the side and then we reapply them at each season. And all the rhinestones come off too? Uh, no, we just take the whole piece off. Oh, I see, because um, that's where they yeah. are. Yeah, and that is part of the reason behind why they're located there, so that we can take them off and it can be cleaned um, without losing any of the sparkle. Dominique, thank you so much for uh, showing us uh, the, the costume. <laughs> Everything has changed because of COVID, including the whole uh, last half of the last season uh, uh, being canceled and the Nutcracker being yeah. projected on the side of a, uh, of a building outside the Cobb Energy Center, right? Or on a big screen Yeah. and also being online. But uh, how, how has it changed things, uh, say here in, in, the, uh, in the costume shop? Um, well, for us, we just, we have to be more aware of, of course, our space. Um, you know, we've tried to make it so everybody has a bit more of their own workspace. Um, and with the dancers, we just have to be extremely aware in fittings to make sure everything's cleaned before and after. Um, and just to take a little bit more time in between dancers, you know, um, in normal seasons during Nutcracker, we can have you know, we'll be doing fittings every 15 minutes. Um, and so that's a high turnover. And now we have to kind of slow that down and give ourselves time in between. And now, as, as you pointed out, this is where you build and, uh, and repair uh, 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 costumes, but you have hundreds of costumes and we, you have a big warehouse where you keep them all, including a room that's cold as if, uh, because the costumes like to stay cold. They do, or at least at a, uh, a consistent level and right. it, we also have dehumidifiers to help keep uh, the moisture levels down. So we're going to uh, go and check out that warehouse where you have costumes dating back 20 years and uh, maybe even longer. Yes we do. <laughs> but Colleen McGonagall, I appreciate you taking time with us right here. Thank you so much.
now in the studio with Sergio Macero and Emily Carrico, both of whom dance principal roles in The Nutcracker. They have danced, you've danced the role of Marie, mm -hmm. and Sergio, you've danced the role of the Nutcracker Prince. Mm -hmm. Usually you dance in different casts, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, but they are actually a couple off stage, and that yeah. is why they are not socially distanced as the rest of us are. <laughs> so, first of all, I'd like to ask each of you, um, a little bit about Yuri Posikov. Uh, his work is extraordinary. He has created works for the Bolshoi Ballet, for San Francisco Ballet, where he's resident choreographer, for the Joffrey Ballet. I've seen him in rehearsal. He's very passionate. What is it like to work with Yuri Posikov? Emily? It's an unforgettable experience. I mean, First of all, you just have to like pinch yourself because you can't believe you're in the same room with someone who has worked with the best of the best. And then you just have to listen because he's very particular about what he wants. Mm -hmm. Like you said, he's very passionate. And um, it's intimidating, but it's intimidating just because he's so passionate about what he is creating. Mm -hmm. And um, it inspires you to do your best so that you fulfill his his wishes and what he foresees the the movement to be so intimidating but inspiring yes a good intimidating a very good <laughs> intimidating what about you Sergio I think it's a unique experience mm -hmm. I mean you know with as a dancer you work with different choreographers and when you work with somebody like Yuri Posokov it makes you feel like you fulfill your job as a dancer at its greatest possi possible manner because I mean he's so what I mean to say so passionate mm -hmm. about his work that makes you dive into it 100% there's not halfway with him and you don't want to either like you just want to give everything that's in you and I mean working with somebody like that it is something incredible as a dancer. Wow I've seen the style it's really unique um, it's a constant sense of flow, mm -hmm. it's a little off kilter sometimes. Um, what do you think, what would you say sets his style apart, uh, Sergio? I think that 50-50 moment and musicality. Mm -hmm. For Yuri, if it's, not, if it's not musical, it could be the most beautiful step in the world it's not going to be the right step for that part of the music. And the same thing goes with moment. If the dancer doesn't look comfortable, it's probably that he's not comfortable. And if he's not comfortable, it's not going to flow the right way. So I think that he blends those two amazingly to get to a choreography that both for the dancer and for the audience just flows and it's enjoyable to both watch and dance. I don't think I could have said it any better. Those are the two <laughs> points that I, I was thinking as well. For him, he just, he always wants movement, movement. There's no stagnant position. It's not about a pose. It's not mm -hmm. about the leg. It's, it's about how everything flows and everything is just embodying the music. And you know, the music is always flowing. So the movement always has to flow and it's, it's a joy to dance. Wonderful, wonderful. So my next question has to do with your roles in this production. Most Nutcracker productions uh, have, you know, a Snow Queen and King, have a Sugar Plum Fairy and Cavalier, but in this production, the role of Marie and the role of the Nutcracker Prince are much bigger and more extended and surely quite the test of endurance because there's no Sugar Plum Fairy to step in and take over. You guys have to carry the ballet all the way through. Um, so my question for you, for each of you, is how does this bigger, larger role enhance the story or the meaning behind the ballet? I think that it, it enhances the meaning behind the ballet because it it really shows Marie's growth with the Nutcracker Prince. 
you don't have them going from you know the battle scene where they they work together and then they're in this enchanted land and they're looking around they are in the enchanted land they're dancing they are experiencing all of the the um, the different dances in the second act together and then there's a culmination of them dancing together for the final time so it just it's a journey unlike a lot of other nutcracker versions that just is i think a little bit more heartwarming and um, storytelling how does their relationship evolve through this ballet well it, it begins with her just being kind of shocked you know she did have this small doll and then she looks up at the top of the cabinet and there's a handsome prince and <laughs> you know at first it's shock a little bit of trepidation you know who is this and um, and then as the snow scene goes on it gets more um, thrilling so much movement so much jumping um, you know they're enjoying their time together on essentially a first date um, dancing okay. in the snow and then you know second act progresses and it's more of love instead of infatuation, I would, I would say. Oh, that's beautifully put. And I think that's where you can really also see how human Yuri Posakov is, because I think it really embodies humans in those roles, like how they meet, how a relationship progresses, and how you know, it gets to a point in second act where like, you fully trust uh, Marie, Marie fully trusts you, and I think that he did an amazing job in portraying that throughout the ballet. So just to think about the Nutcracker in this country, it's kind of a cultural phenomenon that it's become a holiday tradition for us. And Emily, you grew up in the United States and so probably danced in many, many Nutcrackers over the years. What role has the Nutcracker played in your development as an artist? Um, it's always just been a constant, like every year, of course, mm -hmm. um, but uh, a way to get on stage every year, which I think as a student is very important. Um, you can take class and rehearse, and, but you know, there's nothing like being on stage. So getting on stage every year as a student is, is crucial. And the Nutcracker has so many different parts and um, varying difficulties of dances so it's a very good way to grow up you know starting with dancing a mouse and mm -hmm. then moving up you're doing an angel or harlequin or you know anything mm -hmm. like that and um, then you finally reach some more difficult roles so for me growing up doing nutcracker was just always like oh i hope i get this this the next part the more difficult part i hope i'm marie next year i hope i'm in the snow core next year and always just something to look forward to something to um continue working for mm -hmm. it was very important when i was growing up yeah so there's like this progression of mm -hmm. roles and you get to one level and then you have something else to aspire to and work towards the next year and, mm -hmm. and, and again and again I want to ask you a little bit more about your training because we've had conversations before and you had back surgery when you were quite young, mm -hmm. uh, spinal fusion, um, and then you found ballet. How did you experience ballet as a form of healing? Um, Sorry. I found ballet very just um, thrilling. I, I really enjoyed the challenge. So anything to take my mind off hurdles that I had overcome before was a step in the right direction. And I was very hungry to just do better and please the teacher and, um, and do my best. So I think having that to work towards and not concentrating on, you know, you probably <laughs> should be taking it easy or whatever. It didn't matter to me because I was working towards a goal. Growing up and beginning ballet, it was a way to um, not only get my body in shape to where I had a strong enough back um, to just continue through, through life in general, um, it 
ballet just gave me that drive to reach for something more, even though I had been told that maybe I wouldn't be able to achieve X, Y, and Z. I didn't just achieve X, Y, and Z, I achieved much more. Exactly, because you had said the doctors doubted you'd be able to run mm -hmm. again after the spinal fusion, and now you're dancing the principal role in the Nutcracker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all those years of training and the structure of ballet. Mm -hmm. Yes, it just instilled the right kind of mentality um, to overcome anything. Yeah, dance in itself has the ability to give us the tools to overcome obstacles and to deal with challenges. Um, certainly we've all had a lot of challenges uh, since last March with this pandemic. And for instance, I know Atlanta Ballet had a production of Giselle that was just about to go up in a week and suddenly we were all sent home and it's been a long journey for all of us through this pandemic. In what ways, Sergio, has dance enabled you to adapt? I think that, um, you know, people have suffered a lot during the pandemic. We've suffered in the sense that we couldn't come to the studios, we couldn't stay in shape, do what we do, and especially what you mentioned, going to the theaters and perform for an audience, which is what makes us keep going the most. Mm -hmm. So that's been hard, but at the same time, it's been really, um, it's been a really good feeling to, to know that even though we couldn't get to the theaters, we've still been able to, through online resources, through just outdoors, different um, situations, we've been able to transport that um, art to people that perhaps was needing it even more than us. Mm -hmm. And with, with everything that some families have gone through, I think that something very important for them was maybe just to take their mind off the current situation. And even if through a small piece of dance that we've done in the past that we've been able to share with an online audience, that's probably helped a lot of people to take their mind off everything else. So knowing that even if we were not doing it right then, but maybe we had clips from before that we've been able to share with those people. It's, it's been a really good feeling to, to know that to a certain degree, we are doing our part. Yeah. yeah. And I think the company has done an amazing job just sharing um, you know, to the best of their abilities with and reach out to the biggest audience that they could possibly reach to. Emily Carrico, Sergio Macero. Thank you very much for talking with us. Thank, Thank you. you. It's our pleasure. This is Thomas Folks, who is the general manager of right. the uh, Atlanta Ballet, and you are also the production manager. Uh, yes, I'm the director of production, so everything that happens on the stage, except for the dancing, sort of falls under my world. And uh, what you have in here are thousands of costumes. We were just in the costume shop where they're busy building and fixing, but you have a lot of shows that you put on. We do, we have all of, all of the shows that we build, we store all the costumes, get stored back here in their own special space. Um, so I'd love to take you back there and show you. Let's go. Let's do it. So this is the beginning of the costume shop. We keep everything uh, has to be on wheels, of course, because everything lives here but goes to the theater. So this is our row of what we call the costume gondolas. Um, and so everything gets transferred into a gondola to get taken uh, over to the theater, gets labeled what it is, every rack, every costume, labeled with the dancer's name and what it's for. Uh, each show, of course, takes a different number of gondolas. I think 
Our current Nutcracker is something like almost 20 gondolas worth of costumes. It's hundreds and hundreds of costumes. And Colleen was telling me that uh, the costumes are incredibly valuable. That That's $600,000 worth of costumes. Yes, at uh, least. At uh, least. At, at least. So yeah, so we, what's, What's so great about um, this new Nutcracker is when we built them, of course, we were pretty full in storage and because they are so well made and handcrafted, we really needed a place to store them that was climate and humidity controlled, which we didn't have in this building. So what we did is we built for Nutcracker this entire room, all just for Nutcracker with air conditioning, humidity control and lighting. It? Let's go check it out. Sure. It's a two-story, it's a two-story room, so we have the non-humidifier stuff upstairs, such as some of the masks and things like that, but all of the really beautifully handcrafted costumes come in here. And you can see this was all um, hand-built by our own staff. So racks of costumes all the way down on both sides, all the accessories, everything. And room to grow as we have more cast, of course. Every dancer is a different size, so sometimes we have to make a new costume when we when we get a new dancer. So this will inevitably grow uh, over the over the years. And you just keep the old costume. We you, do keep the old ones. We're, we're, because inevitably, again, once you make one size, you keep it and you make another size. So as the dancers rotate and they come and go, um, it's great to have them. And also we're able to use them for the school. Um, our Center for Dance Education uses a lot of our costumes um, in their performances because we love to give the students a chance to um, be on stage and be in costumes just like professionals. So Colleen was telling me there are 200 costumes that go with that show, but there, you probably have many more than that. Yes, exactly. So we've prob we probably, for this version of Nutcracker, we probably have almost 400 costumes. For the whole warehouse, it's probably uh, several thousand costumes um between all of our shows you know we have costumes dating back um, i mean over 20 years we have costumes from um that we get to pick and choose from uh and use for everything um new nutcracker of course you see all the spare fabrics behind you um everything of course handmade for this show so this is our pride and joy mice fur right here yes exactly in case so you need to build a new mouse exactly we had to do all of that we're um getting the spare fabrics for the future was actually a big part of our planning process because it's a 20-year show we had to be thinking about, again, different sized dancers, uh, wear and tear, and making sure we could replace the fabrics with the proper fabric so it still has the same look. These guys are a little creepy. So this is the, these are our Nutcracker masks, uh, handmade in England, um, which is amazing. Um, each one is a slightly different size for a slightly different size head, if you can believe it or not. They've got the little, um, essentially, construction helmet and bicycle helmet straps on the inside. Um, because dancers' heads are also different sizes as well as dancers' bodies. So we've got to have them all. We've got to have small, medium, and large. And now out here, you've got uh, uh, another couple of thousand costumes. Yes, absolutely. So this is a great way to see. If you look down this row, this is, again, more of our original Nutcracker from the last 20 years. Um, and we still get to use those a lot for both the school and for other events. Um, you can see we're starting to store things up high because uh, we, we just consistently run out of room. Um, and the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is all of the things that aren't clothing that we have to do. We have ribbons and shoes and undergarments and belts and hats and scarves um, that all have to go with all these, all the headpieces. Ballet loves headpieces. Um, so we have tiaras everywhere uh, for various shows. Um, so there's all kinds of great um, stuff. We have extra, of course, extra machines. Um, the main ones are in the costume drop with Colleen, but Again, for this show, we had to bring in twice as many stitchers to help us put stuff together. So we have extra machines for them that we pull out and put in the shop as well. Fantastic. Now, what are we going to do? Go upstairs here? You want to? Uh, yeah, let's take let's take a let's take a walk up. Watch your step, of course. As I said, tiara. There you go. <laughs> Oh, look at this, this gives you a good view of the... Uh... Right, so now we're standing up here on top of where we were. Um, what we've put up here are some of the rehearsal clothes, a lot of the masks, um, and again, a lot of those accessories, hair, hair accessories. Um, here's rats, um, rat heads, and see, you can see they've got the shoulder straps because they're so large and heavy. Um, this is sort of some of our older Nutcracker masks. Some of you longtime Nutcracker aficionados might recognize the pig and the bear, um, so that's been great. 
So this is a lot of um, both, both old and new nutcracker mixed sort of stored in a way so that we can have access to it as we need to. The, um, you say this is a 20 year show, uh, this, this new nutcracker. In other words, the previous uh, one, the previous staging was, uh, had been at the Fox for 20 years. Mm -hmm. This one you're preparing to, to uh, you want to see it last. And to... we, really, we, we really do. We, we invested a ton of time and energy and effort into making it the best show we could possibly do with the most forward looking technology and up to date um, choreography. Uh, we really feel like it's a nutcracker for the ages. Uh, and so we are doing everything in our power to make sure it lasts and looks as spectacular in year 20 as it did in year one. On the other side of this wall, you've got all of uh, uh, of your set pieces. Yes, yeah, so I would love to take you down there and show you the magic down there. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive. Let's go check it out. Let's do it. now with artistic director of Atlanta Ballet, Gennady Nedvigin, and we're going to talk a little bit about the process behind this production of The Nutcracker and how he has navigated the past nine months or so during this pandemic and how perhaps we may have a new perspective on dance and on the arts. So Gennady, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be joining you. What I find striking about this new production that uh, you pretty much co you produced it. You're almost an impresario in gathering together the artistic team that created the production. Is that it has that appeal to our love of tradition, right? Um, it's grounded in. E.T.A. Hoffman's original story um, and the era of E.T.A. Hoffman. Um, and yet, somehow that creative team were able to unpack, uh, draw out something new and fresh from a production that's been done many, many times in many different ways and create something that even though it holds onto the tradition, offers the story with a new perspective. Can you say a little bit about how the team came up with this idea? Well, um, first of all, we, we had an amazing creative team and um, it was an honor to be with them in the same room, um, talking and discussing and developing the ideas and bringing uh, thoughts on the table and those creative ideas. It, it was an amazing time. And we started pretty much working on it almost three years before we opened it. So it was a lengthy process. And for me, it was first time ever working on a production of the full length ballet. And one of the biggest ones probably in my lifetime um, because it is major. Um, I think the creative team were basing on traditions and the creative team consists out of uh, people from different countries, different um, places. So everybody pitched in something that they had, they grew up with, and they uh, transferred it maybe a little bit differently and brought it in into the ballet. So there is a, it's a summarization. It's not, not one person that created it. It's, it's a, a huge collaboration. Mm -hmm. It was really exciting to be part of it. Can you give an example of something that someone on the team brought in from their childhood? Tom, Tom Pye was um, our uh, scenic designer. Uh, he, he brought a lot of uh, like toys, like the, the cartoonish ideas, the kind of 2D flat to 3D with the projection by Finn Ross. So it all kind of came together and, and became much larger and, and much more vibrant uh, compared to like, you know, old style toys that, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, and you see it in production, but with the lights and everything around by um, uh, David Finn, it all becomes alive and, and much more exciting in a way. Yeah, it's like, um the idea that Drosselmeyer has this almost 
power to change scale, you know, how a, a, the chair becomes, it starts out just as a normal piece of furniture and suddenly it's filling up a third of the stage in the middle of the stage and it, it's much, much larger than life. The cabinet, uh, it's, it, you know. It's huge, yes. And, and, you know, we experimented, we had different things, different ideas. You had, Yuri Posakov had many ideas and he was kind of seeing it all and we were trying to fit it all on stage. <laughs> you know, when we first time saw the, the um, in the small scale, mm -hmm. the size of things, how yes. they're going to fit into the stage. <laughs> uh, we actually questioned would it fit onto the stage. We literally had to like measure every mm -hmm. foot so that the, it's possible to enter. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Kennedy Center because this production was created for the Fox and uh, CPAC in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so th those were the challenges of how huge and magnificent those um, scene elements are. Um, so just to, thinking about the idea of adapting, when the pandemic hit, tell me a little bit about that path for you and how, as an artistic director, you have managed to navigate a lot of unpredictable twists and turns? Um, well, it's a, it's a hard one because navigation in these waters, unknown waters, for everybody was a huge challenge and uh, around the world. And doesn't matter would it be leaders, political leaders, or uh, leaders in the arts or businesses. Everybody got into unknown waters, basically. And um, all we could do is um, to put our creative minds together or separately and come up with the ways how we can stay safe, but stay alive mm -hmm. um, in, in many ways. In, in details, of course, we, at first, when we just got hit, we said we can't just stop. So um, we turned to TV, to virtual reality mm -hmm. right away. Um, pretty much everybody around uh, the world did that. And we started doing Zoom classes. We knew that dancers cannot stop because stop will, will bring the, the whole art scene to halt. And, and um, we have to keep it moving. So we were exploring new ways how, how to continue moving. So sometime during the summer, you all found a way to bring dancers back into the studio so they could train. Can you tell me how that worked? Uh, yes, well, from the, at the beginning, we, we were allowed dancers to come into the studio and use the space one by one, on their own, uh, making sure that it's clean before the next person comes in. So one of the first um, steps we did, it, it was uh, bring the summer intensive uh, program live okay. and Sharon Story, Dean of the CDE, uh, Center for Dance Education, did a great, great and amazing job uh, preparing all the materials, working with CDC guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that it's safe to bring um, students into the studios. And based on that experience, we were able later on when our season were supposed to begin, bring our dancers back in the studio. But um, instead of, for example, working in one studio, having our morning class, our tradition, our breakfast mm -hmm. for dancers, in one room we had to split it and we were using four rooms mm -hmm. uh, to do that so that we have smaller pods, we call them pods, pods. Uh, groups, yeah, of dancers that they stay uh, social distance. You can see the squares, that's squares are um, assigned for each individual dancer so they don't cross, they stay within their square, they wear masks, um, the rooms are disinfected daily, they disinfect their own stations where they, or bars where they, what they use. You can see numbers around, that's also 
so um, there's a lot thinking went into uh, bringing dancers back and allowing them to be active. And um, just thinking about, um, I, it gets emotional. Mm -hmm. um, when the first day dancers came back, the joy, it was amazing. Social distancing made it necessary to cancel this year's production of The Nutcracker. But very quickly, I believe, your team came up with an alternative solution, a very creative solution, which is this 2020 virtual Nutcracker experience, which involved kind of three main components, right? A drive-in movie and uh, the virtual version of the Nutcracker, which I understand you and Atlanta Ballet videographer Brian Wallenberg edited together from a number of performances from the last, pre the previous two seasons. And then the social media 30-day Nutcracker, uh, you know, offerings on social media. Um, putting together the video, um, I understand it took a lot of effort and work between you and Brian to edit together an aesthetically beautiful piece. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Um, well, uh, to start with that, yes, our team did come up with idea that when we knew that we had to cancel Nutcracker, our live Nutcracker performances, mm -hmm. we knew that this tradition has to stay alive and we came up with the virtual um, way how we can uh, stay stay here and with our audience and and provide some joy for the this season so to answer how we were working on that is uh, we, we're basing on our opening night performance because i think it was the most magnificent exciting uh, there's that special nerve yes. um, and that, that was the version that we uh, worked with. We worked with the different cameras from different mm -hmm. views and that's what was kind of the challenge to where to zoom in, where to zoom out, what to put, what when somebody walking by coughed and we could not <laughs> use it, you, you know, how to smooth yeah. it out. So it was more about that, what, what angle to, to choose and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And it's collaboration and of course, majority of editing and um, picking things went, went on Brian's shoulders mm -hmm. and he did a great job with that. So I'm, I'm very happy how it all turned out. Well, Gennady, is there anything else you would like to say about the Nutcracker uh, as it will be available to people through December the 27th? Well, um, of course it's available to people on demand. Mm -hmm. uh, we're happy to share, please, join it's only $25 per link it's not a um, big amount but we want everybody to have this happy and merry um, mood and during this holiday season so please join us and um, stay stay tuned we'll, we'll bring some more and I hope to see every, everybody in person in the theaters a year from now I hope so too. Gennady Nedvigin, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Thank, thank you. you very much. Hey, we're here with Thomas Folks, who's the general manager of the Atlanta Ballet. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. My pleasure, my pleasure. And you've brought us into now this part of the warehouse is where you have stored uh, all the scenery, not just for the new Nutcracker, but for. Uh, all the shows that you do. For all of our productions that we do, everything sort of starts here in one way or another. It's scenery, props, lighting, sound, uh, the space where we make, the stuff that we make, the stuff that we store, the stuff that we rent, it all comes through here and it's stored here. And I see you got your lighting trusses here and your, your road cases. Or... Exactly, everything we do has to be on wheels, of course, because it all, we don't perform in our own building. So everything goes on a truck and over to a theater. So. So we love wheels. So, uh, so they're we like a rock and roll band. Exa then. It's a lot like that, actually. It's very similar in its way. Or just um, once we get after the lighting, it's all nice boxes. When we get into the scenery, is where the shapes start to get weird and where the the truck Tetris begins. <laughs> in addition to being general manager, you also are 
Construction manager? What's uh, the, director of production. Director of production. So basically anything that happens on the stage that's not dancing, that's in my world. So uh, making sure the floor is set, making sure all the lights are on, the scenery, making sure the orchestra's ready. Um, all of that falls under the production department, which I also get to head. And now that means that you also had to deal with uh, staging a drive-in movie uh, outside the Cobb Energy Center. We did. That was a very unique experience. Yeah. It, it was, um, we had the idea sort of in the, in the early fall. Um, and of course, uh, uh, my family has gone to the Starlight Drive-in many times, and we thought it would be such a great idea to do it up at Cobb Energy because they're big, good partners for us. Um, but it was a very different experience. You know, you think it's kind of the same, but we, I learned a lot about outdoor video, outdoor lighting, outdoor decorations, but it's been a real blast to figure it all out. Uh, and it was just a huge success. And now you, so uh, you were telling me a little bit about the new Nutcracker, which has been at the Fox in 2018 and 2019. Correct. It was built for the uh, Cobb Enter Energy Center, but then COVID happened. So uh, it's what, twice as big in terms of just all the sets and, and, and every, everything? It takes up that whole half of the warehouse. Here. Exactly. So it, take, it takes up like 40, almost 40 to 50 percent of our, of our set storage space that we have in our building. Um, it is definitely over twice as big as the old Nutcracker. Um, the technology is all current. There's tons of video. The scenery, as we like to say, oversized, uh, for lack of a better word. But um, we have some of the tallest set pieces certainly I've ever seen. You know, our, the giant cabinet. Um, which is one of the most magical moments. It's 30 plus feet tall. And describe the cabinet arrives at what point in the, in so, the show? So in the, in the middle of act one, um, as Marie sort of fades into her dream world, the cabinet, her world transforms from uh, her parents' house into her oversized world. The giant cabinet comes on, the giant chair comes on, the giant book, everything happens. The cabinet arrives full of live living toy soldiers, three <laughs> stories of toys. To, uh, 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 toy soldiers um, that are dancers that all exit through these giant doors um, that magically open. So and you have 12 stage it hands takes pushing it's it so on. It's so heavy. It's, it's multiple tons and it takes 12 stage hands giving it all they have to push. We could use more, but you, you really can't get any more people around it. So, uh, so kudos to them. It, it is not an easy job to push that thing full of dancers as well. Well, we are, uh, like I say, backstage at uh, the Atlanta Ballet at your really huge uh, facility over here on uh, Marietta Boulevard. Uh, and uh, we get a chance to, to uh, visit places like this uh, because we want to give you folks a, a, a chance to peek a little bit behind the scenes. If uh, uh, the, the community conversations that we have give you a little, a little insight that you might not otherwise get. And, and I'm hoping that uh, Mr. Folks, you can, you can show us some more of those details back here. Well, I would love to. And as a, as a native Atlantan, I just want to say I'm so grateful that, for what you guys do and that I'm able to be part of this continuing tradition. So the great thing um, about our warehouse is that it's all in one big location. We're very lucky that we have everything here between our offices, our studios, and our warehouse. So all of the production staff gets to all work in the same building. Um, what, the way we sort of store things, of course, is kind of most used to least used. Normally, we start pulling out rehearsal props as early as late September, early October. Um, so they're kind of stored in the front. I'll show you these right over here. Now, why do you need props for rehearsals? So, of course, dancers like to use, they like to have their hands on the things they're gonna be dancing with because it changes their weight, it changes their balance. As they're spinning, they wanna make sure they know exactly what kind of spacing they do. But of course, we're hesitant to use the real props because we, we wanna keep them safe and shiny and pretty for the stage. Right. So we have stand-in props is what we do. So this is a bin of stand-in props such as the soldier rifles, um, some hula hoops. We have uh, some of the skiers that we use and some, some drums that we can use. Um, so these all live out front. Um, the other funny, the other thing that we we're talking about the cabinet earlier. Now this looks like a, uh, this doesn't really go off or anything like no, that. No, correct, right? that's okay. just straight up wood. The ones we have for the show are the same size, but yeah. they're actually much more detailed. Whereas this looks like a real sword. That is an old sword from a different show that we pulled for the Rat King to use because it's got weight to it because his real sword is so much heavier. Ah than the other sword. So we're trying to balance. But you don't mind messing that one up. Right, exactly, exactly. So these are the things that if he happens to drop it while he's practicing, not a big deal. Right. Um, but the real swords, you know, we wanna make sure we keep them again, looking great for the right. show, for the audience. Um, the other fun thing that we had to do, because as we said, the dancers interact with the giant cabinet so much, 
And of course they can't have it in rehearsal, but they have to practice getting in and out of it. We, we built this replica of the bottom part of the cabinet that does roll into the studio so the dancers can practice climbing up and down in it. Um, you can see this is our stand-in Nutcracker doll, of course, from our last <laughs> production. Um, so these are the sorts of things that we use in rehearsal in the studios to get the dancers ready for them to get on stage. So when they climb into the, the cabinet, this is, they have to climb up this, this, high. this height. Yes, exactly. This is, an ex this is the same height, width, and depth of the first level and then the there's, there's uh, catwalks going up to the next level? Yes, and then there's a whole back, well, yeah, we call it the fire escape. Right. Um, it's a giant, basically, staircase that bolts onto the back of the cabinet that right. gets you up to the different levels. Which is not visible to the uh, audience. Correct, correct. And then in the cabinet, there's these beautiful golden slides that the dancers mm -hmm. can use to get down. Now, when are you going to let this guy out of prison here? Well, you know, I think he has to, um, he has to serve his time. Um, <laughs> uh, he, did, he did 20 years in the old Nutcracker, so now we use him. Um, he's a little bit of our, of our little sentimental doll that uh -huh. we use in rehearsal. He's in retirement now. Yes, exactly. Um, and we do have sort of, he's, uh, he's not quite as large as our new Nutcracker doll, but the dancers sort of love him, so we, we still keep him in circulation. All right. Because it's, it's a very sentimental thing. That's cute. All so. right, we got a snake back through here, of course. Normally this would all be very empty because it's December, um, but right now it's all still packed. So this is sort of where we start. You can see some of the cases here, all labeled Nutcracker. The little chicks that everyone loves. Um, this is there, what we call the egg cart. And the front of it is all those painted eggs. Uh huh. Um, and uh, you can't see this, but they can open. <laughs> <laughs> as you can see, a lot of it is flat too. We, much of it is flat as we can. The giant flowers are flat. Um, the tree legs, all that. The giant, the giant Christmas trees are all flat. Um, but then you get into the big stuff: the cabinet, the tree, the book. And that's up here. And that's on up here. If you're go ready to climb, yeah, you want to climb? Go right ahead. Let's do it. Okay. Let's try all not right, to watch your step. Yes, sir. Hang on. <laughs> here I come. Great, so here we are. This is the bird's eye view. You can kind of see the vast majority of the show all around you. And now this pink uh, here, that's the chair yes, that Marie exactly. uh, climbs into. Yes, interesting fact, the chair is one of my favorite set pieces at, at all just because from the front, it looks like a fully sized overstuffed chair that's 20 plus feet tall. When you walk around, when you walk around to the side, of course, because it's built in forced perspective, it's literally only six feet wide. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing, and that way when it exits, it gets to slide right off stage. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about the chair is that it's literally only five pieces. Huh. Um, you can see the sort of salmon colored um, design painted, hand painted to match the fabric huh. um, that was purchased in London. Um, but really it's only a handful of pieces that all fit together and it's very wide and very narrow, but built in such an amazing way that from the front, it's stunning. And it weighs four tons. Uh, the, the, the chair, uh, the book definitely weighs four tons uh -huh. um, because of, uh, to keep it open. Um, the chair, thankfully, the chair can be moved by about four people, okay. um, which is great. Um, like we said, the cabinet, 12 people, um, 10 people for the book. Uh -huh. uh, we managed to get that. Thankfully, we can set the book at intermission, so it's, we don't have to do it in front of an audience, <laughs> which is good because there's lots of grunting. And they're uh, all on rollers. And everything are on these um, super uh, industrial, high quality wheels that also are designed to not damage the floor. But, so you're hoping next year uh, you're gonna be where you guys are supposed to be. Uh, we cannot wait to put this in Cobb Energy Center. Right. We love working with there, it's a great space. Um, our patrons, we just can't wait for them to see it there. Um, while the Fox is, is lovely, C CPAC is our home and, and we can't wait to put it there and just, and, and have it be there for the next 20 years. CPAC, by the way, is oh, Cobb, Energy, performing. Cobb Energy Performing Arts Center. Right. Yes, a little backstage <laughs> <Okay>. jargon. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing us in here. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm so grateful that you're here and, and, and that your subscribers want to wanna take a peek backstage. It's, it's so fun to get to share what we do um, with you guys, and hopefully next year everyone will come out and see it on stage. Well, we, we appreciate the subscribers making this possible, and... Uh, if uh, you want to see more of these things and support my colleagues and myself in uh, going backstage at places like the Atlanta Ballet, you can go online to AJC.com slash worth knowing and, and help us out. Subscribe and you can get all kinds of interesting material like this. Thank you, Thomas. My pleasure.
That was great. I had a blast. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I enjoyed this visit very much, and I learned a lot by talking with those artists. To me, it's like this is the holiday when I get a chance to, to see the Nutcracker. We couldn't see it on stage. We can see it on demand. But we also got a chance to peek right behind the scenes, and that was a lot of fun. Yes, it was great fun and great fun to have a chance to speak directly with some of the artists who made the production happen. Which is why we bring these community conversations to you and we're glad to do it. For the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, I'm Bo Emerson. I'm Cynthia Perry. And we'll see you later.